Hey, deserving listeners, this is a documentary on Amazon about the Twin Flames organization. I just got done reacting to the Netflix documentary, and so I thought I'd fire up the Amazon documentary, which apparently gets into a lot of other sorts of things. So let's watch. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Let's see what comes out of my face as I watch. He cheated on me, and I was trying to make sense of that. I started going more into a spiritual realm, trying to find answers to why I couldn't let go of this person. I couldn't, why? Why this guy? And I kept hearing this thing called twin flames. Yeah, I suppose that's another factor that could lead people down a road of being susceptible to occult influence because there's the cultural notion that you should be able to let go. And if you listen to my content about this topic, you've heard me say this before, but grief takes time. Sometimes you'll have a relationship that was six months, but it was intense. And after the breakup, you're still grieving six years later. That's not uncommon. And society does not value that. In fact, it pathologizes it. If you tell friends that you're still suffering, they'll be like, just let it go, move on, find someone else. Stop obsessing. Don't live in the past. Stop dwelling in the past. What's wrong with you? You're, you have a victim mentality or you're choosing to focus on it. It's like, no, I'm not. I'm, I, I'm a human being. And, and uh, you know, so it, it's this notion. And I get a lot of questions from people. How do I cope with the pain of this breakup, this divorce, this loss, this death, this you know, loss of a job, loss of an ability, um, whatever, you know, and I'll say that question alone is a result of being indoctrinated into this idea that emotions are a nuisance, that people with emotions, especially difficult emotions, are weak or spiritually not right. This notion that there's a pill for everything, that there's an answer, there's a technique, you know, hack your brain, hack your emotions. It's ridiculous, it's, it's destructive, and it I think could absolutely lead people to being open because for this individual, uh, you know, it was a, the first time she was ever, I think what she's saying is deeply in love, the most in love she'd ever been before. And then it was a terrible breakup. He cheated on her. And for a time after, and I'm going to take a guess and say it, it wasn't even that long, maybe a couple years. And she's still suffering. You know, she hasn't found someone else. She still thinks about him. She still cries about it. She's in pain. And She's like, what's wrong with me? How do I how do I cope? How do I let go? And she starts going on the internet and then some charismatic leader says, I have the answer. And then they're off and running and they're in a cult. Multiple lifetimes. And it's an idea that's really gaining currency. Megan Fox says that Machine Gun Kelly is her twin flame. Told me I was your twin flame from and actually Ryan Gosling had to file a restraining order against a fan who was convinced that he was her twin flame and was stalking him. I'm trying to remember if this was in the other documentary. I feel like I heard this before somewhere. And who knows if the stalker was influenced by Jeff and Shalea, but at least the idea has been out there. So another aspect to this is that Jeff was using that zeitgeist. I remember, and of course, this is a romantic notion that's been around in various societies for a while now, but it uh, uh, seemingly was talked about more five or 10 years ago. I remember there was this, I think it was a Plato that talks about how in the spirit world, we're one person with four legs and four arms. And then when we're born, we are separated. And then it takes a while for us to find our person. Uh, don't quote me on that, but you know, it's a romantic notion. It's a way of framing how things feel. It's not scientific, of course, and it's probably not even helpful to think that way because this notion that there's one person, a soulmate, for example, is not likely accurate and also could lead to people making poor choices and being demoralized if they felt like they found their soulmate and it doesn't work out, then I guess they'll never meet anybody. You know, we, there's probably... It's probably a small percentage of people around the world that we would be compatible with, but in that small percentage, there's probably tens, hundreds of thousands of people. <laughs> What's the chance that uh, we've all met every single possibility of a soulmate and we can conclude that our current soulmate is that one person? 
it's not a very romantic thing to say. I mean, it's not the sort of thing that you put on a Hallmark card or a Valentine's Day card. It's like, I'm glad I found at least one of the people that I would be compatible with, and you're one of those people. <laughs> but, you know, that's probably how it is. Um, it's, you know... I, uh, I, you know, I, because it described a lot of the things that I was feeling towards the sky, you know, this irrational connection towards someone and they seem like this other part of you that you can't let go of and why shouldn't there be someone who is the exact partner that I seek? Well, so already in the beginning of the first episode on Amazon, they seem to be, or at least getting into different material. And it is illuminating in a better way, I think, how this twin flame concept and the things that Jeff and Shalea would be proselytizing, that it encourages stalkering and it also validates people. I hadn't really thought about that till this individual was talking that the, so it's a confluence of two things. One is, is that when we are broken up with or dumped or we're lonely or something, it feels bad. And we will long for someone, maybe a particular somebody. That's normal. We also have this cultural notion of a soulmate, of one person that there's one person for you. And you can imagine religions also getting involved in this as well. Even religions that don't traditionally talk about this sort of thing, you could imagine a notion being bandied about that Look, God has a path for you, and God has chosen someone for you. You just have to have faith that God will help the two of you meet or help the two of you work things out. And usually in those discussions, there's not this allowance for, well, God has set up a scenario such that there's probably a lot of people for you, and you have to find that person, or at least someone in that group of people, and you have to try to work on things to have it work out. You know, you don't hear that kind of religious sentiment. You know, usually it's it's fated. God knows all, and God wouldn't necessarily waste your time. Or I don't know. Anyway, I'm, it's maybe that's wrong. But the point is, is that there's these two things. You have the normal human pain of loneliness and or longing for someone that has left you. And then you have this cultural notion of of a soulmate, that there's one person out there for you. And you're wondering, like, why do I feel this way? And then someone comes in and says, oh, well, that person's your twin flame. It, it would be very validating because that's exactly what they want to hear. They want to hear, yeah, my feelings are normal. I'm not strange because culture is telling me I'm strange because I'm still f f having feelings about this loss. And I want that person back to me. And of course, we're twin flames because when you fall in love, and particularly maybe when you've been dumped when you don't want to be dumped, you will put a million dollars on on the fact that, yes, we are made for each other. They made a mistake by breaking up with us. Uh, they, us, <laughs> but you know, he made a mistake by cheating on me. He made a mistake by breaking up with me. She doesn't know what she's passing up. Our relationship was perfect. Those are things that you will hear from from people, and it's just a normal bias because it just feels so true to the person being dumped. Obviously, it's not true. <laughs> I mean, I guess sometimes it might be, but it's not usually. I just want to step over to Arcelia. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Very well. Yes. Perfect. So, you made it to class today. I was stuck in a state of limerence. I was obsessively trying to mend this connection, bring this together, November 2017. Okay, that's really interesting that she mentions limerence. I've been a podcaster for over 15 years, and I have over time noticed a pattern of certain questions that I get. You know, people will email in questions or ask questions in the comment section, and you start to see certain patterns, certain topics that uh, a lot of people are interested in hearing about. And a lot of the topics are intuitive, things that I would expect people to ask about because they are common things that people suffer from. But some of the questions I would get, I'd be a little uh, confused about. One of the questions that I would frequently get that I was confused about was questions about limerence. And I, in the beginning, would not really uh, uh, regard them, not because I was dismissing them, but because, you know, I get a lot of questions, so I have to prioritize. And uh, uh, but over time, I started seeing this pattern, and people were like, oh, please do a deep dive on limerence. And I, I would wonder, what is 
where is this coming from? You know, because if someone asked me about preoccupied attachment or narcissism or something, you know, I, I kind of get that. But if someone's asking, why are so many people asking about limerence? And it wasn't a huge group of people. It was a small group, but they were very passionate about it. And so I started looking into it eventually, years into it. And I discovered that there's this online discourse around limerence. And it, 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 it is discussed in the clinical literature a little bit, but not much. Like for me, in my circle, I don't, I, I can't remember a single time where I've heard a clinician talk about limerence. I can't remember a single study that I just randomly, like if I look up limerence in the clinical literature, I will, f I will find occasional references to it. But in typical psychological relational literature, I I've never seen it before because we have other words for it. We have words like grief. The typical words in the grief literature will be longing or pining or ruminating, this kind of thing. And then outside of the grief literature, within the relational literature, you'll see words like preoccupied attachment or disorganized attachment, fearful attachment, th th those kinds of words. And there, there are other words, but this word limerence, I'm thinking, where is this coming from? And why aren't we just using the established concepts that we already have? It seems like limerence is this, especially on the internet, like a cobbling together of a lot of different topics. And so I worry sometimes that there's an online discourse that doesn't have a lot of contact with the clinical world and people are developing this notion and solutions to it and perspectives about it and narratives about it that could leave people susceptible to a cult, right? Because if someone came to me and they said, I have limerence, I'd be like, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, you know, someone broke up with me and I'm really sad and I think about them all the time. I don't know what to do, and it's like I can't get through the I can't get through my work day. I'm depressed. Every song and every TV show um, when I'm walking down the street, it just reminds me of them. And I would absolutely validate them, and I would be with them, and I would say, unless I hear anything otherwise. I'm here to tell you that, sorry to tell you that this is a normal part of life. It's not only just a normal part of being dumped, but it's normal to be dumped at some point in your life. But this is not what the Disney movies are about. You know, they don't talk about these moments. People don't Instagram about the fact that they're still grieving the fact that they got divorced 15 years ago or that their partner cheated on them three years ago and they, they are still experiencing the pain of that. You know, people don't Instagram. And so uh, I'm here to tell you that as a person who hears from people and their actual emotional states, you are totally normal. In fact, everyone that you're thinking isn't um, dealing with this probably is. When you're, you know, when you're suffering and you're driving down the street or on the bus or you're walking down the street, you just think like, because you're suffering, you're just like, look at all these people. None of them are suffering. They're probably all suffering in this way. They just don't show it on their face, you know, and they're shamed into suppressing it. So, it, it, it sucks and it's it's okay to cry it's okay to pine your body wants to do that tell me more about it you know a lot of people will be stuck in this quote-unquote limerence phase because they are never allowed to grieve which and how is it to grieve well it's to talk about it to reminisce to get angry to get sad to cry on someone's shoulder to someone to um, you know validate and take care of us we grieve socially we grieve emotionally we grieve through behavior like you might eventually get to a point in the grieving process where you take all the the gifts that they gave you and you uh, throw it away or burn it or <laughs> i don't know make an art creative thing out of it uh you know grief is a behavioral emotional social process that is often denied us because one, we're so disconnected. Two, people will shame you. Three, the shame's internal so we don't even reach out to other people. So this limerence idea sneaks in there because it, I think, is attempting to explain that thing. But to me, it's there's nothing to explain. It, it's grief. It's the normal pain of life. When I was in high school, I got dumped and it hurt very, very badly. And I was struggling and in the normal way, not in any sort of abnormal way. And, but it was severe, you know, 16 or 15, and it was a big deal. And I you know, had support in my life and had been raised well enough and was journaling a lot and had friends and family and people around me. And I eventually came to the conclusion that in order to be an adult, you have to go through this or something like that. It was something like everyone has to go through the process of being dumped 
and having it being devastating in order to learn lessons that will help you in the future. If you don't go through that, then you have a very naive Disneyland childish idea of what relationships are and what they should be. I don't think that's necessarily true, but you know, I'm 16 at the time. <laughs> I was trying to make sense of my world because that's how it felt to me. It felt like, well, when I looked back at the way I was and the assumptions I was operating from before being dumped, it uh, I looked back and thought, boy, that person, although innocent, was naive, was operating on a set of lies that wasn't really told to me, but I didn't know were, at the time were it was culture that told me those things. But they also might just be kind of natural inclinations that we have as humans. Who knows? Possible. It's impossible to tease those things out. But the point is, is that I still hold to that to some extent. I don't think everyone has to be dumped in order to be a wise, uh, healthy person. But I think that it's a normal part of life. I think that it's a helpful part of life. It's It hurts. But I think that it definitely helped me to go through that. And I'm glad that I went through it at that age because... If I went through it when I was 36, then I think there would have been more consequences. And I think that's another thing that I'm noticing here is that a lot of the folks will, uh, you know, like what she said, and I don't know her circumstances. Uh, they went into a little bit of it, but she, in the interview, was saying that as a trans woman, she decided at one point that she was going to date and fall in love. She said, okay, world, I'm going to date and I'm going to fall in love. And the way that it was framed, it sounded like she was older, but you can imagine someone, and, and she was talking about this, that she grew up in a conservative area and, you know, you wouldn't want to date necessarily because um, you're still not in the body that you want to be in. You can imagine someone delaying it, but I think a lot of people are delaying those kinds of relationships more and, and, and more often. Now, there's pros to that, right? Because you have lower teenage pregnancy or unwanted pregnancies. You have potentially lower STI transmission. I don't know if that's true, but you know, it, it's uh, most parents are probably hoping that their kids wait a little bit longer, <laughs> you know, for some, I think, good reasons. But I think that, meaning having sex, but I think that the way that I grew up, and you know, could just be my own bias, but there wasn't anything to do in the 80s except for socialize, including dating. <laughs> and so, uh, and it, it was always that way since we were born in the 70s, right? And we were used to it and we didn't have anything else to do. So that's what we did. And we, I, I'm guessing, had greater uh, um, acceptance of that and also com comfort level with socializing and walking up to people in public, that kind of thing. And so I think that that model of, uh, you know, people learning and experiencing those things early in life so that by the time you start looking for your twin flame, you have some wisdom about the emotions that are normal and that, okay, I'm in love this time, but you know, I've been in love before. And okay, I'm being dumped again, which hurts, but you know, I've been through another dumping and I thought I would never get through that. And I did, you know, it, time and grieving healed. And five years later, I fell in love again. So, uh, you know, you learn some skills and some you, you gain some wisdom and you might also get better support from people because they've been there before you know i sometimes i i worry that young people today are blind leading the blind when it comes to dating you know what i mean i don't know uh, of course there's plenty of young people who date and off, uh, socialize often i'm not going to characterize everyone that's young it's just a trend you know it's a bell curve anyway what am i saying i'm saying that it's interesting that she's talking about limerence because I wonder how many of the folks that got tricked by the Twin Flames organization were indoctrinated and in that world of limerence or some other thing. All right, well, let's adjourn there. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.